Good morning and a happy Sabbath, Windermere family. Uh, we are few in numbers in this congregation, but all these empty seats are filled with angels. Amen. And we thank you to those that are on YouTube and Facebook um, that you were able to join us this morning. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Um, I always like to tell people that, you know, you're not here by accident, you know, uh, but God, like certain things had to happen for you to be here this morning. And you just happened to, to do, to take those actions that God led you to, to bring you here this morning. You think an algorithm brought you to, brought, brought you to this live stream. That was God. God brought you to this live stream and we're glad that you are here. So I'd like to welcome you all to the Sabbath school. And I pray that the, that the speaker will, will uh, enrich our hearts with the, what the general conference has put on, the, has put on their hearts to tell us this week. Um, this is my first time doing a welcome, so I'm, this, is, this is off the cuff right here. I don't, uh, what? Okay, all right. So I will pray, and then we will go on with our Sabbath school. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're able to bring us all to this moment safely. I thank you for the, the congregation that is gathered here and online. I pray that your, your Holy Spirit will, will be with them as they worship with us, and I pray that you will, you will be with us in our midst, and that whatever we say and do here this morning will be a blessing, and that it will um, enrich us, and that we may, it, it will enrich others that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again, and a happy and blessed Sabbath to all. It's always a delight to be in the house of the Lord on Sabbath day, and I know we're all happy for that. There is a guide that never falters, and where he leads, we cannot stray, because step by step, he goes before us. So let Jesus lead. He knows the way. He knows the way that leads to glory. Our every fear he will allay and bring us safe at last to heaven. Let Jesus lead. He knows the way. Of times the path grows dim and dreary. The darkness hides the cheering ray. But still we will trust, though we're worn and weary. Our Savior leads. He knows the way. Oh, he knows the way that leads to glory. Oh, every fair he will allay and bring us safe at last to heaven. So let Jesus lead. He knows the way. Let our Jesus lead. He knows, he knows the way. May all be blessed. Sabbath everyone online as well. Um, the scripture reading today comes from Romans 8, 38 through 89, and it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, no heart, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ our Lord. May God bless the reading of his word.
All right. Happy Sabbath, church family. I think we were so, here so late last night that most people aren't here as yet. But the work continues, and we pray that God will hasten the footsteps of those on their way this morning as we have our Sabbath school here at Windermere SDA Church. I want to say a special thank you to our young people, Josh and Gabby, for helping to lead out, and our not-so-young people, Sister Gloria, for singing for us. Thank you so much. You are a gem, and we love you all. God bless you. We've been having a very powerful youth revival this week. Amen? Those of us who have been able to come have been blessed beyond measure. And those who were not able to come, I know last night was live stream, and then today you'll be able to join in in this powerful conclusion for Youth Week. Now today we are looking at lesson number 13 from our series that we've been doing on the book of Ephesians. Last Sabbath we were reminded that the book of Ephesians is a set of letters that was written to the church in Ephesus by whom? Who wrote the letters? The Apostle Paul. He wrote the letters to that church so that they could be encouraged, they could be united, they could stand firm upon the fact that Jesus Christ saves and that he is doing everything to ensure that we will make it into glory land one day. Amen? So these letters have been divided into six chapters, and we, over these last three months, have been taking each of these chapters and looking at it under the microscope so that we can get a, a greater understanding. Today we are on chapter 6. We continue on chapter 6. Last week we did the first part of chapter 6 verses 10 to 20. We looked at the fact that we are in a spiritual battle, right? We have no control over it. There is spiritual warfare going on in the cosmos. And this started even before mankind was created. Now the good part of the message is that as much as Satan and his demons, the one third of the fallen angels, are doing their best to make sure that we are deceived and rob us of God's love, and what God has prepared for us, we have a bigger army that is fighting for us. Amen? That gives us hope. And so today, our topic for our 13th Sabbath is waging peace. Amen? While that war is going on, God is teaching us and showing us through his word that we can have peace in the midst of the war and we can bring peace to others in this very dark world. Amen? Amen. So those, welcome my darlings, we missed you so much. Welcome back. Um, for those who don't know, my name is uh, Sister Dion Ware. And we have with us Brother Hollings, who is visiting from Georgia. He's on vacation, and we're glad to have you with us. May you be blessed today in our, in our worship experience. Amen? Amen. So today we are going to look at how God is teaching us to stand strong in the midst of this war. All right? So he has given us seven armors, seven, seven weapons, I should say, in his armory to help us to stay strong in this spiritual battle that we are thrown in the midst of. No, no choice of ours, but we are in the midst of this battle. So we're going to discuss God's armory 
um, the armors that God gives us to protect us. Now, the one, two things I wanted to um, bring to mind, and I'm going to write it on this board, is that we have two types of weapons. We have the protective weapons, the first five that we're going to look at, and we have offensive weapons, the last two. So in total, it's seven. We have one for each day of the week. Hello. All right. So let me write that on the board. Protective and offensive. My dear um, elder uh, Simeon has put up for us a picture of a Roman, Greco-Roman soldier decked out in his armor. And the Bible is now going to teach us how each of those elements of the armor is in what ways we will be protected by this. Okay? You ready to go down this journey with me? All right. Okay. So let us start by answering the question before we look at the individual parts of the armor. Let us start by asking the question that came up in Sunday's lesson. Is this armory that God has given us for protection, is this just an individual situation um, where it's just for me? Or is it collective for the church? What do you think? And I need some feedback as to your thoughts on this. Is it just, just for me, the armor? Is it just for me to protect me? Or is it a collective protection for members of the church, sons and daughters of God? Anybody want to um, just tell me your opinion on that one? Yes, yes, my brother. Brother Holly. Oh, thank you. It's, a, it's for the collective, it's for the church itself. It's for the church itself. Thank you so much, my brother. And I'm glad that you said that. Yes, it's individual. We are responsible for our own salvation. Like, I can't be saved for my husband. He can't be saved for me. Right, right, my brother? Um, but Paul, throughout the letters and throughout this book of Ephesians, is teaching unity. So we are to be each other's keepers. Last night, something very powerful happened here at church. When the pastor gave the altar call for the young people, some of them came up. And when they stood up here and they saw that some of their friends weren't up here, do you know what they did? They called up their friends. They went for their friends. In other words, I am not going to get into heaven without you. Wasn't that just powerful? That spoke to my heart. Where we are to hold on to each other. We are all going there together. And we as a family, we are going to make it through these difficult seasons that we will be in. Right? So... To me, like my brother says, it's not just an individual armor, it's collective. We are going to band together collectively to shield ourselves from the devil's onslaught. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, uh, and of course, if we are going to be an army, you ever see one soldier in an army? No. We usually have a whole band of soldiers. We're all soldiers in the Lord's army. So we're going to look at the five protective weapons. The first one is the belt of truth. Belt, can't even spell, belt of truth. This is very powerful. The belt of truth is the first protective. So protective means this is what you're going to be covered in. Here comes my, my soldier. Come on up here, soldier. <laughs> Thank you, Andrel. And Andrel, if you could stand on this side for me, we are going to point to your belt. Okay? Okay, we need that helmet off of salvation right now. 
belt of truth. Now, let us talk a little bit about the belt of truth. What do we know about truth? If we look, and now remember we're discussing Ephesians 6, and we're taking it from verses 10 all the way down to 20. The word of God is truth. Amen? Amen. And it is vitally important for us to wear the belt of truth. We need truth, especially in this confusing world. Amen. We need truth, right? If you want to sit, if you, if you get tired, you can't sit because I'm going to have you here the whole day. Because this is supposed to be a youth day, so we'll be using up the youths today. So my friend Andrell has been so kind to volunteer to do this for us. Um, can somebody find 1 Peter 1 verse 13 for me, please? And I'm going to speak until you can find that. Truth gives divine power to destroy the lies of the devil. Right? Truth gives divine power to destroy the lies that the devil bombards us with every day. The word of God, which is truth, educates our minds so that we can stand firm. Truth the belt of truth is the first thing that we see as part of the armor. Anybody wants to um, address the fact that the belt of truth secures us? God's goodness and grace helps us to be saved, and Christ covers us in that righteousness. Truth is very important. Now, do you see the world that we are in today? especially with our political climate, you have what they call alternative facts and, and things that are dotted with 90% truth and 10% lie. It's still a lie. And we have to know in our hearts, based on the word of God, what is true and what is not. The good thing is that it is all documented for us. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. Truth is truth. God is telling us that he is the truth and the answers that we need for anything can be found in his word. Do we know this family? Everything we need. My sister always said the Bible teaches us everything that we need to know. Right? Teach us how to live. It teaches us how to how to watch what we say. It teaches us everything. The Bible is truth. So we are to use God's word to protect ourselves. The truth of God's word, that belt, must be girded. Good morning. Welcome. We are to gird ourselves in God's truth. So that is our first protective armor. Yes, my sister. You just saw... Uh as I'm studying the lesson this week, um, I try to think about a, a practical application. Yes. How do I put on the belt of truth? The Bible tells us that Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We know that we learn more about God and his truth by studying his word. And so if we are not students of the word, then we won't have the truth. Exactly. Um, Sister White says in her writing that only those whose minds are fortified with the word of God, the truth of the word of God, will be able to stand in the last days. Amen. So what, what um, in my mind, I think Paul is called, Peter, or Paul, sorry, is calling us to the study of God's word. Right. So as a church, collectively, we study the word of God. We do our Sabbath school lesson. Mm -hmm. And individuals, we study our Sabbath school lesson, study the word of God so that our minds can be fortified with the word of truth. And that is one of the, one of the um, weapons, the, the, the word of God. The word the of God, yes. the sword of the spirit. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's when we are wielding it in defense. Mm -hmm. But here you're girding, getting ready for war. 
And so the war, where is the field? Where is the battlefield? In our minds. The battlefield is in our minds. Yes. Yes, you can have people that come upon you to persecute you, mm -hmm. people that treat you badly at work and whatever, whatever. But the devil wants to control our mind. And that this is, is where the call. warfare is being yes. fought. Yes. So this is a call to defend our mind, the battlefield, by the studying and knowing the truth of God. Amen. By studying his word. Thank you so much. Now, does, uh, did anyone find 1 Peter 1 verse 13 for me? 13. I thought it was verse 2. 13. 1 Peter 1 verse 13. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. It's yeah. a re wherefore, gird, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. So we are to gird ourselves up with the truth. And like my sister says, it is our mind. The battle is for our mind. If the devil can take your mind, can conquer your mind, he's got you. That's where the battlefield is being fought. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right, so now we're going to look at the second, the second protective um, weapon is the breastplate of righteousness. You notice the breastplate, it protects your heart. All these important organs fall right up in here. The doctor can explain that a little more. But the second protective weapon is breastplate of righteousness i can't spell when i am close to the board so forgive me if i get this wrong anybody want to tell me their thoughts about the breastplate of righteousness anyone want to um, discuss that breastplate of righteousness while we are, are getting um, our thoughts together on that one of the things that comes out of the passage in Ephesians 6 is that all of these weapons that we're discussing are of no use if we do not put them on, right? The seven things or the five things that we're going to discuss and then the other two, it's, it's, it won't be active unless you put them on and take them on. We have to stand and put on these things, right, so that we can be protected. In other words, it is an active thing that we have to do. We have to accept what Jesus is offering in these weapons. And when we accept these gifts, we put them on. We must pray in Jesus' name as we use these protective armors. Um, and if you don't accept it, it means that you're rejecting what he has to offer. That's basically it. Yes, my sister. Again, I'm thinking about the, the practical application. Yeah. We know that we have no righteousness. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And the scripture told us that Jesus will give us his robe of righteousness. Amen. And, the, and righteousness is, righteous, is right living, isn't it? Yes. And so to put on the breastplate of righteousness is to protect us from the the um, of wrongdoing, things that are around us. You know, our life should be that of one that glorify God, treating people right, being kind, being true, being, being faithful, showing love. That is the, the righteous living that will protect us from the evil living that's around us. Amen. And so in my mind, I'm thinking Christ will help me to be righteous in my living so that I can be defended against the bad things around me. Amen. And so that's how I, I think of it, um, the breastplate of righteousness protecting me from the evil that's around me. Praise the Lord. That is beautifully said, sis. Because as you said, we have no righteousness. Christ gives us his righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness, when we lay hold to what Jesus is offering us, we can be covered in his righteousness and we can find our way through this warfare. Yes, my sister. Uh, the white mic. White? Try it, I think it's white. 
for 1 Thessalonians 1 8, I like what it says. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the, bless, the breastplate of faith and love, Amen. and for the helmet of hope of salvation. So, like what Sister Gail says, we have to have love. This is our breastplate. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. And you know, somebody, I was listening to somebody talk about 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 that you just talked about. And it said, because that whole top, um, sentence talked about righteousness, faith, and love, right? And the person says, righteousness saves us, faith encourages us, and love keeps us. These are gifts from God, and the scripture tells us that we have been given a measure of faith. Everybody has, give, got, has received some measure of faith, right? And with that little measure of faith that we have received, we can increase our faith by reading God's word, seeing how God has proven himself in the past when he said something he meant it, he did it. He's done it in our lives. There are times when God has taken me to impossible situations. And then when I buck upon another impossible one, I'm questioning if God is able to. No, we must know God has the power to do everything and anything, right? So this breastplate of righteousness, faith, love is what is going to help. To guard us in this spiritual warfare. Yes, my brother, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you. Um, this righteousness, uh, we know uh, Jesus is our righteousness. Yes. But also he's imp he impart righteousness unto us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I think about Daniel's situation. Uh, he was a man in that kingdom. And there was other wise men and other people there. But notice what happened when trouble really came. They called Daniel. Amen. Uh, the reason they called Daniel because Daniel had lived a righteous life. That's right. And there's something about the world that has such a respect or awe or fear mm -hmm. of a person that lived uh, a righteous life. Righteous, a and righteous they know life. if you're living a righteous life. You don't yeah, have to yeah. go and say it to anybody. That's true. But the way that you live will demonstrate that, right? Yes, my sister. You know, this thing of righteousness, um, it's so far-fetched at times when you think about your own sinfulness. And will you ever attain it? You know, but as our brother said, Christ imparts that to us Amen. and give us the strength to achieve it. Um, Sister White wrote in the book, A God's Amazing Grace. She says, each one will have a close struggle to overcome sin in his own heart. Mm -hmm. This is at times a very painful and discouraging work because as we see the deformities in our own character, we keep looking at them when we should look to Jesus and put on the robe of his righteousness. Amen. Everyone who enters the pearly gates of the city of God will enter there as a conqueror. And his greatest conquest will have been the conquest of self. Mercy. And as you're saying that, sis, last night when Pastor Carter was preaching about Elijah and the fact that after he had done that amazing miracle on Mount yes. Carmel, yes. once he got the threat from Jezebel, he got scared. He ran. He went into depression. He begged God to kill him. Right? And what was the message there? Because God went after him and said, what are you doing here? Right? The message is, when Elijah was caught up to heaven in that chariot, Elijah had suffered depression, suicidal thoughts, and doubt. And he went straight into heaven anyway. Let me tell you, when you are wrapped up in God and you have his protection, we will fall. We will doubt because that's what Satan is doing to our minds. But if we can remember that we have the weapon to fight against these lies and the spiritual warfare family, we will make it to heaven. 
the we'll make it God. to glory land. Amen. So we have God. hope. Hallelujah. Amen. We have hope. So let us look at number three, which is the shoes of peace. Peace. Boy, that word. Peace. You have those shoes, bro? Let me see your shoes. Shoes of peace. Mm. Wow. So if you look at the one in the picture up there, it is more protective. It goes from right below the knee down, right? And the question is, why is it important to protect our feet? That part of the armor. Why do we need protection for our feet? Anybody? Just throw out something for me. To avoid distraction. Okay, that's a good one. But aren't our feet, we, we have to carry the word. We are given the great commission that we are to take the word to the end of the world. We need to be able to stand. We need to be able to walk. We need to be able to go. Amen? Amen. And our feet must be able to deliver the gospel of peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Does anybody in here know what it feels like to not have peace? I've been there. It's a terrible place. It's a dark place. So we are being uh, given that measure, that gift of faith in this, of, of peace, in these spiritual protections that we're receiving. The shoes of feet. Our feet need protection to allow us to carry out the great commission. To go into the world and proclaim the news of salvation. And it is important when we talk about peace, why it is so relevant today. John 14, 27, Jesus is saying, my peace I give to you. Jesus is giving us this peace, not so that we can keep the peace for ourselves, but that our feet will take us to deliver the message of peace to somebody else who needs it. Amen? Good morning, ladies. Welcome. Right? So, because the devil in this world, look at the world we're in today. I don't know about you. I don't even watch the news because my poor little heart can't take it. Anytime I am passing and the news is on, I hurry up and pass it, quick, quick. Because it does something to me. It distresses me. And because I know it distresses me, I stay away from it. This world is in trouble. Right? And each of us have that, uh, that we have been given a command to take this message of peace to somebody else. To somebody else. So we have to guard our feet. You know, shod our feet with the, um, the peace to, to go forward. Because the devil is the author of confusion. Are we living in a confused world today? Yes. Girl don't know if they're boys. Boys don't know if they're girls. You hear one thing in politics. And then you're like, but that is not true. And then you start to question your mind if what you're hearing is true or a lie, which is why we have to come back to the word, Amen. the truth. Amen. Yes, my sister. Talk about confusion. We had to do a computer-based training just this week, training us to change the way we speak. When we're asking someone, are you a male or a female, you have to say, what assigned sex were you given? Mm -hmm. What is your assignment? And the other thing was, I, I, I go by she, and what do you go by? Mm -hmm. You, it's, you, it's, you it's now free. have to change the way you talk to patients, yep. the way you ask about their, their gender. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. After 30 years of practice in medicine, no, you, have to to speak a different you have language. to question your brain. <laughs> yes. Yes. The confusion it, is it, real, it's sis. It's absolutely crazy. So... So Satan will do that to us because with confusion comes despair. Yes. And, and with confusion, there are negative emotions which cause people not to function in peaceful ways. Yes, my brother. Yes. Uh, we need to think about uh, our, um, our example, Christ our Lord. Yes. Uh, there is no temptation that took taken us that uh, he's not aware of. And Matter of fact, whenever he went into the wilderness, 
He used a tube called the Word of God. We're getting there, brother. We're getting there. I'm <laughs> glad you said it. We so, are getting there, yes. So, so what I'm saying is, um, we, it, it's, it's not something that we are afraid of. Mm -mm. It's not something that we wonder about, even the politics or whatever's going on around us. Yes. We are not afraid. No. Because we have Jesus. There is no battle that ever took us that Jesus had not experienced himself. Amen. And so uh, we, we have already uh, conquered us. Praise the Lord. We can walk in victory, not in our wonder. Amen. Thank you, my brother, for those words of encouragement. Yes, my sister. And as we talk about feet. Yes. Isaiah 52, 7 says, how beautiful upon oh. the mountain nears the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Hallelujah. I like that verse, and I'm going to memorize <laughs> that verse. <laughs> Amen. And that's part of what we have to do. When we get down to um, number seven, six, we will see that we have to memorize yes. these verses. Yes. The Bible, putting the Bible on a mantle has no protection. No. There's nothing to protect you by setting this down somewhere in your house. There's not no here if here that's going to come out of the Bible. The weapon is in the words. Amen? Amen. The weapon is in the words that we can go to these words and we can speak them in the midst of our trials, just like Jesus did. Amen? Beautiful. So the gospel of peace can help us show others how to live. A large part of the warfare, as we said, is mental, and that's why Satan attacks our minds. It has a lot to do with how we think, and what we're constantly thinking about. Peace helps us to overcome the devil's attack on our mind. And you and I must have shoes of peace to deliver this beautiful message to others. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So what is number four? We talked about the belt, the breastplate, the shoes. Now we have the shield of faith. That's another one of our protective weapons, shield of faith. Let's talk about that faith. Anybody want to take that one on for me? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It goes right back to the word. Now, if you look at the shield up in that picture, this, this one is more of a decorative one. But in the picture, you notice how large that shield is? It's very protective. That's what they used back then. So it could protect their whole body. You move it up, cover your face, uh, move it to the side. It could protect you all over. And then a lot of times what they used to do, they used to stand side by side by side. So the shield would cover a whole lot of people, right? <laughs> right, right, and that is it. We and, and my sister brought up that that very powerful point: the fiery darts that the devil is launching at us. The shield of faith quenches all of the fiery darts, not some, but all, and that is a message of hope there. There will be darts which we need to protect ourselves against. Darts are sharp points that hit us in specific places. Yes, my brother. Uh, so in terms of the shield, you, you, like you said, it was decorative. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way that we, we saw this at the, the, the costume store, they said this was it's based on a gladiator's right. um, outfit. So what that shield would be used for like in the in the Colosseums where they would they would fight to entertain the 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 rich folk. That shield was used more on an individual standpoint right. to fend yourself against your opponent. Right. The Roman soldiers' shield, when put together, often you'd see them you when you know when they they'd be side by side and they put them over their heads to form almost a protective barrier right. around what they were protecting. Yes. So um, 
the Roman soldier's shield used together it can protect more than one person. Amen. Whereas this shield protects more of an, more of yeah. an individual standpoint. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Yes. And, and, and when you talk about protection, the devil knows what the, our weakest point. What is weak for me might not be weak for you. He knows where to hit you hard. Let me tell you. And he's going to throw those darts there. And that could include our children. Right? And so we have to be a shield for the, our loved ones. I'm telling you, we have to stand in the gap for people who don't even want to claim that shield. We stand in the gap to do that. And I'm telling you, family, we must be prepared to be able to help to shield some of these fiery darts that are coming at people that we love. Because we might be strong spiritually, but the devil will destroy people that we love. Yes, my sister. One of the most potent fiery dart of the devil is doubt. Mm. When we start doubting God's love for us, doubting God's ability to do the impossible, doubting even the very fact that we look back and see where God has brought us from, and we are, we are now doubting, did God really do it, or did I do it on my own? And so... The shield of faith is, I would say, opposite to that fiery dart of doubt. And as you mentioned, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you notice, everything is pointing us back to the, the study word of, of the word of <laughs> yes, God. Yes, yes. And, you know, accepting the truth as it is in Jesus and taking on Jesus and allowing him to carry us through these um, turbulence. So Mercy. again, the faith that we need is to oppose that fiery dart of doubt. Amen. Yes, my brother. Uh, when we look, when we look at uh, the ducks on the water, yes, they um, they had felt that the gods had prepared them that the water would not penetrate or hurt them, no wow. matter what storm or whatever going on, mm -hmm. no matter how deep the water is. Mm -hmm. Also, we can look at the uh, other things in nature mm -hmm. and how God protect the fish. The fish had so many scales that protect wow. it from the environment around That's it. That's their shield, huh? That's their shield. Thank you, my brother. And so I'm saying the church, God is talking about us this morning. Yes. We ought to protect each other in love. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. We are to protect each other in love and stand in the gap for one another. Amen. Amen. Now, number five, helmet of salvation. So just show me your helmet. Helmet of salvation. Now, let, if we look at the helmet, what is the helmet covering? Head. Our heads. Did we say originally that the battleground is, our, is in our minds? Yes. Do you understand that that's a very yes. serious thing? That is where Satan is going for. Attack our minds. We will have the doubt, as my sister said. We will start to believe the lies. We will believe that people are doing things to us when they're not. Right? I mean, that's where he will go. So the helmet of salvation. Let's talk about salvation. Can somebody tell me what salvation is? Anybody? Our, uh, the, the, it is, yes, my sister. Yes, in our lesson, Paul described in Ephesians 2, 6 through 10, he says, put on the helmet of salvation mm -hmm. means to reject the fear of spiritual powers so common in, the, in this time. Reject the fear Re of, of spiritual, spiritual powers. Thank you, my sister. So in having the helmet, we reject that fear because it's a spiritual warfare, as we said, and it's real. Um, we, we may not see that spiritual realm, and that's fine. We don't have to see it, but the Bible tells us that it's happening. And a lot of times, you know, people will ask questions, 
um, why would God allow this man to kill his family? God didn't allow that. It's that warfare that's going on. Satan and his demons are real. And they will attack in every way. Now the protection that the heavenly hosts, the angels are giving us is warding off things off of us. If that was allowed to happen to us, we wouldn't even be here. As we speak right now, it is happening. It is real. And in addition to the protections that we receive from the heavenly hosts of angels, right? God is giving us these protections as well, individually and as a church. Yes, my brother. Is it on? Can somebody lend my brother a mic? This one isn't working. The question, um, what is salvation, I think is a very, very important one. Yes. Because salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences. Say it again, my brother. Salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences. Amen. Because if we misunderstand what salvation is, then we, then, um, we will be confused. Um, because the fact that I'm delivered from sin and its consequences doesn't mean I'm not going to go through trouble. It doesn't, so, so if I begin questioning my own salvation when I'm going through stuff, yes. then now uh, that's where the doubt is going to set in. Mm -hmm. I have to understand that my salvation is deliverance from sin and its consequences. That's what my salvation is. Not deliverance from tribulation um, in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, I am delivered from sin and its consequences. So no matter what you do to me, I am delivered from sin and its consequences. And, and until we hold true to that, yes. we're going to um, be confused when things get rough. Mm -hmm. We have to know that our salvation is assured. Amen. We're delivered from sin and its consequences, not um, you know, from... For, from the bad, the, the difficult seasons of life. Yes, We're not the, and, and, and I'm glad you said that. I remember last night, Pastor Carter made that point that when somebody who is going through something called him to pray for him, his prayer was that God will give that person the strength to make it through this season of difficulty, right? Not to take away the thing. That that's causing the problem, but give them the strength to make it through. Because a lot of times is when we have gone through an experience that we come out with spiritual muscles, we come out stronger for the next time. Yes, my brother. And that is why peace is not the absence of hostility. Okay. Peace is the tranquility of order. Amen. Until we understand what peace is, we're going to live this life believing that we can never have peace because uh, right this moment, I'm at peace. And Amen. then as soon as I step out of here, someone call me and tell me something that put me not at peace. And so it's, it's, a, it's a turbulent kind of thing. No, peace is the tranquility of order. Mm -hmm. I order my steps according to the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord says to me, in this world you will have tribulations, yes. but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I've overcome so, the world. So we need to understand that because otherwise we're going to let go. Amen. Amen. We can have peace in the midst of the storm. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Jesus told us that, didn't he? Yeah. I tell you everything yeah. right here. So let's look at number six. I know we're running out of time. Now, number six and seven are our offensive weapons. What we have been doing right here is showing you the protections, right? The belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the helmet. Did I leave out anything? The shield. Show them up. No, not this one. That one. Right? One, two, three, four, five. Now, let's look at the next two. The, the number six is the sword. Show me your sword, my friend. The sword of the spirit. And what is the sword of the spirit? We've been talking about it. As we're talking about these other things, we've been mentioning the word of God. 
So these first five, which are the protective weaponry, we use to protect ourselves. The sword of the spirit, the word of God. Tell me, sister, sister across. You, you, you use your mic and tell us loud and proud. It's like a two-hedged sword. Two-hedged. Anything through. What does a two-hedge mean? Anybody can take that on for me? Both sides. Both sides. So one is one of one side of it is God giving us the word. The other side is us using the word. Amen. I need you need a microphone, my brother. It's behind you. <laughs> Welcome. I mean. Yes, we have the sword, the breastplate, and, and those things, but our sword is sharp enough. How, how are we going to get it sharp? Amen. And, our, and, and is your shield strong enough to withstand the fiery darts? The fiery darts. So mm -hmm. a shield could be a shield, but it has to be strong enough to withstand the fiery darts. Yes, sir, that is true. But how do we find that strength? It goes back to... In study God, the, word the word of God. God. The word study of the God. Word of God. Yes. As I said, and let me say it again. The sword of the spirit, the word of God has no power sitting on a mantle. There is no, no um, magic. magic that's going to come out of this Bible yes. by resting it down on somewhere. Where is the power that comes out of the word of God? It's in the words. When you can go to the word, and we're going to look at when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan came after him when he was fasting for 40 days. He was famished, right? And when Satan came after him and say, turn these stones into bread if you are the son of God. What did Jesus say? It is written. The three words. It is written written right man shall not live by bread alone jesus went back into was it deuteronomy or leviticus he took deuteronomy and gave satan the, that answer he didn't argue with him because you don't argue with the devil don't even bother try take him on because we can't take him on you know all we have to do is go for the sword hit him with the sword of the word of god right and when, when he told him to fall off of the, the, the thing and, and the, the angels will save him, what did Jesus say? Do not tempt the Lord. Like it is written. Right? And then the third one, I will give you everything. I don't know how the devil going to give God everything when God owns everything. And what was Jesus' response? Get thee behind. Right? So Jesus used the word to defend himself and that is him teaching us to use the word of God in every situation we find ourselves there are scripture verses to help us through it yes my brother yes you were saying something and you notice he always say have you never read in the scriptures if what you notice when Jesus say those words, have you never read in the scriptures? Have you not read in the scriptures? So he, right. bases, his, he bases his authority on the scriptures. On the word of, and then if on Jesus the word of God. uses the scriptures as authority, then what are we to do? We are to do what Jesus, yes, my brother. We, we realize what we're looking at earlier. Mm -hmm. Protecting ourselves from the enemy. Yes. It is good to protect ourselves, but in a fight, we have to be on the offensive. We gotta move forward. The shield might seem insignificant. I mean, sorry, the, the sword might seem insignificant in a fight, but that is what we use to go forward with. And when the enemy sees the sword coming, advancing. He will have to run away and hide. Amen. So the sword is very important in any fight. Amen. That is when you move forward by faith. Thank you so much. My so, sister. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I like when we speak in figurative terms because that makes us feel good. Here's the thing. 
in order for us to do that, we have to love justice. With all of these things, the thread with all of this is to love justice, okay? And when we talk about moving forward, if we love justice, where to be on the offensive is to speak out against what is injustice, is to stand up for what is right. No matter what, because sometimes, you know, um, 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 there was, uh, um, there was a, um, a, a senator from, um, from Texas, I forgot his name, but John F. Kennedy, when John F. Kennedy went to the Senate, John F. Kennedy went and sought him out and said to him, what advice do you have for me? And he said to John F. Kennedy, in this place, to get along, you got to go along. And sometimes we go along to get along. And that is injustice. That is injustice. So, so let's not just speak in figurative terms. Because in order for all of this, for all of what we're talking about here, we have to be lovers of justice. What did, what did the Bible say? Micah, we are to love. Micah 6? Yes. Micah 6, 8? Mm -hmm. we got Quoted. To, we we, we, we got to love justice. And, and do justice mercy. and love mercy, mercy and live humbly. Live humbly. Amen. Right. And that is how we're going to establish that. All right. So it, it, it all comes together. It all comes together in this spiritual warfare that we find ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, sis, before I make my last point. Yes. Brother Ash, Elder Ash asks, is our faith strong enough? Is our shield strong enough? And I, I just want to read this brief quote. It says, I asked the angel why there was no more faith and power in Israel. Mm -hmm. He said, he let go of the arm of the Lord too soon. Press your petitions to the throne and hold on by strong faith. The promises are sure. Believe ye receive the things ye ask for and ye shall have them. I was, I was then pointed to Elijah. He was subject like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. Mm -hmm. His faith endured the trial. Seven times he prayed before the Lord, and at last the cloud was seen. I saw that we had doubted the sure promises and wounded the Savior by our lack of faith. Said the angel, gird the armor about, the, about thee, and above all, take the shield of faith, for that will guard the heart, the very life, from the fiery darts of the wicked. Amen. We let Amen. go too soon. Amen. All right. I'm going to move. I know we only have five minutes. I want to get to point number seven, the seventh one in our weaponry, and that is power in prayer. Power in prayer. Now, in um, Ephesians chapter 6, and as we know, Ephesians chapter 6 is the last chapter of Ephesians, where we have been looking at verses 10 to 20. In verse 18, Paul, who at this time is in prison, right? He was, he said, he asked the saints, he said that he's requesting the saints to pray for him. Yes. He's requesting the saints to pray for him. Now, now, family, we know that there's power in prayer. We have proven it in this church over and over and over again. Right, my sister? There is power in prayer, and that is why it is an effective, offensive weapon against the devil and his demons against us right it is an effective weapon with god nothing is impossible right angels stand in awe that we human beings have this limitless power to pray and get answers to our prayers the angels can't understand it right and we are to use that offensive weapon daily daily to guard ourselves and to fight back against these darts that are thrown against us right and 
as Paul here is requesting prayers of the saints, we are reminded that we are to pray for our spiritual leaders. We are to pray for our spiritual leaders to be able to impart God's word with clarity, with boldness, with enthusiasm, with impact, and with truth. Because there's a lot of lies out there. A lot of people preaching from the pulpit, spreading a lot of lies. So we are to pray that the work that is done by spiritual leaders will transform the, the lives of the adults, the children, the youths, so that we can be empowered for action. Um, uh, Romans 8, we read it this morning, 38 to 39, tells us that the battle is real. The armor is real. God is real. And he's much more powerful than any spiritual darkness that is surrounding us in the cosmos. Right? We don't have to be afraid. We have been given the tools. But guess what? We have to take the tools. We have to put it on. We have to use them. Amen. They're not just going just used by themselves. It has to be an active, intentional decision to use these tools that God gives us. Romans 8, 38, 39 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any creature shall separate us from the love of God. Family is because God loves us why he's doing everything to save us. And I hope we understand that from the depths of our heart. That our loving God, who Satan will try to deceive us to believe that he's a wicked God out to get us when we sin. No! Our loving God is doing everything in his power to save us and so that we can live with him in glory. Amen. Amen. So let us use our protective and offensive weapons to fight off this spiritual warfare that's attacking us. One thing we're reminded that the warfare, the battleground is in our minds. He's going to attack our minds. He's going to He's going to drive us crazy. He's going to drive us out of our minds. He's going to have us doubt God. He's going to have us think all kinds of things. Protect your mind with everything. With truth. Protect it with righteousness. Protect it with peace. Protect it with faith. Protect it with the salvation that he's given us. Protect it with the word of God. And protect it with prayer. Amen. 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 Do we have anything else before we close? Anybody with any last comments? Yes, my, my sister needs a microphone. Um, brother, brother Rod. Okay. Tell us your name, sis. <laughs> my name is Gloria. Welcome. I'm just reminded of the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Yes. I was thinking people go into war and some people die. We could be armed with everything, but then we end up dying. Do we have that faith that despite everything we are willing to die because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to die and God saved them? Sister, so. let me tell you something. Let me answer that one loud and proud for you. As long as when I die, I am with Jesus, I don't fear death. Amen? Amen. Amen. This person standing here, do not fear death. As long as at the end of the day, I am with my Savior. Amen? And I think that is a place that we need to get to where we're not afraid. This, all of this is teaching us not to be afraid. It's to give us hope that there is better. And as our dear Pastor Cross always says, God is teaching us how to live abundant lives right here, right now. And that is something I am very much trying to do as I live here. But my goal is to be with my Savior. So... I don't fear the death at all. I don't want to suffer, though. I don't want to suffer. But I don't fear death. Yes, my brother. Last one before we wrap up. My last point is, um, you know, 
the Bible says God tell us to wait upon him. Yes. There are times you're going to be weary. And like you said, we want to die because we figure he's not coming. When is he coming? But the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, he's going to renew your strength. Hallelujah. When you get tired, he's going to renew your tiredness mm -hmm. and make you strong again. Amen. So never give up on the walk. Those who endure to the end, end. not those who want to run fast, those who hold on and never give up are the ones that are going to be entering. Into Amen. I just said that. Before I come to your brother Rod, and brother Rod will be my last person. Last night, Pastor Carter told the story of the marathon runner yes. who fell and damaged himself. Right. And when everybody else had done finished the race, he kept on running. Amen. He was the last one. And somebody said, why did you even bother to continue to run? And he said, my country, Tanzania, sent, didn't send me to start. They sent me to finish. Let us finish the race, family. And we're going to do it together. Hold each other's hand and we're going to march forward. Yes, brother, run and then we have to close. Oh, ju just, just to carry on, just to carry on with sister, just to carry on Gloria just said. Yes. There's a passage in the Bible, um, scriptures that says, um, who, um, who rather, like, I, um, I rather fear the I rather fear the person who kills the spirit than fear the person who kills the flesh. Amen, amen. So we our we have to fear and respect God Almighty, not mankind. The the war is not between me and you. It's between. It's uh, a supernatural war. All right. Do we understand this family? Amen. Okay. I'm glad we do. We're gonna close. Let us pray as we get ready to um, go into our divine service. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, and my friend Pauline, she's the one that gave me this verse a long time ago. For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plan to give you a hope and a future. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your words, which are powerful Words that move us to action, Lord. Words that give us peace and words that give us hope. Lord, let us hide your words in our hearts so that we do not sin against you. Let us hide your words in our hearts so when the hard time comes, we can quote these scriptures against the devil. It is written and stand boldly, Lord, knowing that you are all powerful and almighty. Thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day, Lord, and thank you for what we have learned today from Ephesians chapter 6, all the weaponry that you're giving us to stay safe in this cosmic warfare. Bless us, we pray, as we now transition to our divine worship hour, and may we leave here, Lord, better than we came. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, family. Bye-bye. And thank you to my dear son, Andrew, for being my soldier. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, Church. Uh, today is our youth day, and us youth will be providing service today. And this whole week, uh, Pastor Carter has been coming out every night. A lot of us has came up and showed up, and it was very fantastic, very amazing. We have been blessed. And I hope you guys are blessed by this service that we're, we're about to provide for you today. So thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. You guys sound a little sleepy. I'm going to say it one more time. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. There's a lot of you guys out there, so I'm pretty sure you guys could be a little bit more loud. I feel like I could only hear about five people. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. You see, that wasn't so hard, now was it? Well, we're so glad that you blessed that you guys are here with us for another sabbath as you guys know today is youth day and let me tell you something if you missed this whole week of youth of prayer you missed something spectacular but of course it's going to continue on today amen so as we sing our intro draw me nearer i ask that you sing with us but i also hope that you're blessed with this whole divine service me mm-hmm. 
Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful and grateful that you saw fit this morning to wake us up. God, you saw fit to allow our eyes to see. You saw fit to allow us to stand on our feet. But God, more importantly, you allowed us to come together and worship you in the beauty of holiness. And so, God, today we just want to give you the praise. You are God. There is none beside thee. You are the chief musician. You are Yahweh. You are the self-existent one. Lord, you are everything that we need. And even the things that we don't think we need, God, you are all of that. So, God, today we've not come to ask for blessings. We've come to then kiss our lips to you, God, and to let you know we love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we invite your presence to be with us, not just today, God, but every day that we have opportunity to live on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. The call to worship is from Isaiah 50, chapter 58, verses 13 to 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. The church is now called to worship. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Sabbath. The Lord is good all the time. God is good good. Now I am standing before you with mixed feelings. I'm overjoyed because of what transpired here this week. Bubbling up, but I'm deeply saddened because the adjet comes back to haunt us. All good things must come to an end. Beloved, this is the final day of what has been a spirit-filled and inspirational week of prayer for all youth. What do you say? Let's say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the, Lord. the preacher from West End leaves today. But you know something? Those of you who were not here last night, I missed a night or two, but I was here last night, and Wednesday night, and Tuesday night. Last night, I believe God showed up. Amen? Amen? I've seen breakthroughs I've never seen before. I've seen victories I didn't expect, and, uh, and so as a result, we decided how could we allow the curtains to come down without baptizing those who have gained the victory? Amen? And so last night in the cubicle, we decided that let the Spirit of God lead. And it suddenly dawned on me, my brothers and sisters, suddenly dawned on me. As a pastor, I've never really looked at it before until last night. I realized that throughout the New Testament, with the thousands of people who were baptized throughout the New Testament, not one baptism was planned. None was planned. All of them were on the spur of the moment. And I said, wait a minute, this is serious. Because not even Jesus, there's no historical record that he took a bag with him when he got baptized. So today we're going to be having a baptism to recapture the inspiration of the New Testament. So I know you came today because my intention is that all it takes for baptism to take place are three things. 
only three things. One, a believing heart. What do you say? He that believe and is baptized. Two, much water. Amen. And three, somebody to do the baptism. And the rest is up to the Holy Spirit. What do you say? So you're here today. You came to hear the mighty preacher. That's what they did back in Bible time when John was preaching. People just went to hear John. But having heard, they were convicted. And there was much water. And they got baptized. Our deacons and deaconesses are ready. And they have prepared. You didn't come with a change. Don't allow that to cheat you out of your blessings today. Amen. I'm just happy to see you out. God bless those who have joined us online. But you are here in person. And the spirit of God who turned up last night. I know has an appointment and he is already here. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. And of course you want to enjoy the day. Now I really want to take this time to really thank Pastor and Sister Carter. I want to thank the preacher from West End for allowing the Holy Spirit to use him so mightily. And no one pastor has got it all. And it's good when the Spirit can move and you see and feel. And so I spoke with Pastor Carter. And I said, Brother Pastor, it is clear to me that the Lord has not just called you, but he has anointed you to speak to the youth, the young minds. And so I would like you to think about it, pray about it, and quickly make a pledge to make your pilgrimage here annually. What do you say? Oh, yes. And so we want to make that an annual thing for this district. To God be the glory. And I want to thank him in advance for agreeing to that. And Sister Carter is going to make sure he stick to that. God bless you, my dear sister. The Lord is good. Enjoy the Sabbath. Enjoy the service. Enjoy the blessings. And enjoy the baptismal service. God bless you. So, of course, we're going to do a little something different. We're going to do a little, a little praise and worship with a good song that we like to call Old Time Religion. Because on Sunday, I got that what? On Monday, I got that? I hope you guys don't sound as quiet when we start singing. Okay?
don't sit down too soon because I'm going to ask you to stand up as we sing our opening hymn, God Will Take Care of You. Do you believe that, church? You guys sound a lot confident, but I can hear you more. Do you believe that God will take care of you? Amen.
Happy Sabbath. May I have a seat with you guys over here somewhere? How is everyone doing? I'm not going to tell you something. Um, I had two stories prepared, okay? And guess what? Pastor Carter preached on them. <laughs> he even paid the kids to answer questions. <laughs> so um, I went in and picked a, a topic, a story that would align with what the week, the whole week has been to, okay? How God can use, can pick and use the most vile of sinners and change them to do great things for his cause. All right? So today's story, I'm going to sit down a little bit. Hi. We're going to talk about a woman in the Bible. Uh, she was not Christian. She did so many things that according to the Bible, she should not be. According to, I mean, according to our standards, she should not have been one of Jesus' ancestors. But God used the most vile sinners to accomplish his work. In this stage, we have a woman. Her name was Rehab. Hi, Rehab. What's up, y'all? Hi. So Rehab is sitting there with her family. And during that time, the Israelites needed to be, needed to get to Canaan, right? The promised land. And Joshua sent two spies to examine the promised land, especially the city of Jericho. Because according to God's command, Jericho was, Jericho was to be destroyed by Israelites. Everyone in Jericho was concerned, and rightfully so. Because the imminent attack from the Israelites, people were talking on the streets and in their homes as well. Even the king of Jericho was afraid because they know God fought Israelites' battle. The two spies came to Rahab's house. It was led by an angel they got to Rahab's home. Look at them. Rahab welcomed them to, their, to her home. Nice. They were so nice to their spies. Mm -hmm. They ate dinner, they off and she offered them a place to stay until they were ready to leave early next morning. While they were having dinner, some soldiers came and started knocking on Rehab's door. Here they come, here they come. Uh oh, so they start knocking. So they start knocking. Nothing. They didn't have any any answer. So they start knocking again. You see, they start saying, "Woman, bring the man inside your uh, inside your house out." For they are spies. They are Israelites. If the soldiers see the men, the spies inside, they would have killed them. So Rehab says to the spies, come on, come on. Let, come with me, hurry, make haste, hurry. She hid the spies on the top roof of her house. Uh-oh. <laughs> so she hid those two spies. You see them hiding? Yes. So after she hid the spies on the top, hoover, top roof of her home, she then went to attend the soldiers because all they were doing, they were keep knocking, knocking. So Rehab went and opened the door. When she opened the door, they came in and started asking, where are the Israelite spies? We saw them coming in. We saw them coming in. Where are you hiding them? So the soldiers looked around trying to find the Israelites. 
They look inside the bathing pool. They look under the bathing pool. They went, they, Rehab had a room that had two musicians in there. So the spies went and looked in their room to see who were in their room. But they were now, they are folks just like us. They look like us. They ain't no spies. They look under the curtains. They look everywhere. Nowhere. They, the spies were nowhere to be found. <laughs> nowhere to be found. They looked around. After they got tired of looking, they went and, and asked again, where are the Israelite spies? Oh, look, they're trying to bargain. Them. They're trying to bargain now. <laughs> no, they will not snitch for 100 coins. They did not do that. And Rehab said to them, we saw them coming in. Rehab said, yes, they did come in. However, they left a short while ago. If you leave right now, you might just be in time to catch them. So the soldiers believed Rehab and left. So they went after the Israelites, trying to find, trying to see if they can find them somewhere. And they were actively looking as they left her place. So after the soldiers left, after the soldiers left, the spies came down. So Rehab went there trying to uh, help them coming down from the roof. Yeah, and after they, after the, after the soldiers left, the, the, spy, the spies came down from the roof, and Rehab told them, I know God has given Israel to you. I know has, God has given this land to Israel. We are afraid, but I've been kind to you. Please promise me that you show kindness to my family as well. The man promised her, uh, Rahab that her family would be safe when God delivered Jericho to Israel. So Rahab threw down a red rope. We're just going to imagine a big window. <laughs> she threw down the red rope for the spies to, to, to climb down the window. And after, and after the man came down the window, the man promised Rahab that as long as she obeys, she and her family will be safe from the destruction. And the story and, and the lesson in the story I want to tell your children is that um, there is blessing in obedience. Okay? There is power in obedience. A power to change. A power to transform, a power to come from something mediocre to, some, to greatness, a power to get the eternal life, a power to get the fountain of youth. But this it lies in obedience to God's command. Amen. 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 May I have a volunteer to pray? Anybody to pray? Can I call on somebody to pray now? Who wants to pray? Come on. My prayer warriors over here. You want to come? Okay. Dear God, I thank you for bringing us here. He is always with us. I ask that he is making us happy and true. I hope that he has a wonderful day with us, and I hope that he has a wonderful day with all of us too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, children. Remember to be obedient to God's command.
Alrighty, guys, it is now time for announcements, and I just wanted to tell you guys some upcoming church events that were, that's happening. Of course, you know, last Saturday, from this whole week to this Saturday, was our youth weekend. We started last week, and from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we were all here each and every night at 7 o'clock to hear what Pastor Carter had said. And I told you, if you missed it, you missed something good. But like I said, it's continuing on today. Later today at 5, we're going to be having um, AYS, and following AY is going to be a social, okay? Um, on October 7th, we're going to have our Pathfinder induction, and after that, it will be followed as a game night. Women's Weekend will be from October 27th to October 28th, and we will have a banquet on the 29th of October. Please remember to pray for all our sick and shut-ins. We want to wish everybody who's celebrating this month a happy birthday. And we're going to actually have, since it is the last Sabbath, we're going to have our musicians play so we can sing everybody happy birthday. Can I get all the birthday celebrants to please stand? Oh, September. My bad. Sorry, guys. September. Can I get all the September celebrants to please stand? Amen. All righty. Please join us as we sing happy birthday. Happy birthday. can sit. Just one more last thing. Every Monday at 6 a.m. and every Thursday at 8 p.m., we have our prayer line. We have a Zoom meeting, so if you would like to join, please don't hesitate to ask Pastor Cross, uh, Sister Danae, Sister Dion. Can you guys raise your hands? Thank you. You can find them, and they can give you, send you the link for our prayer line. Thank you, guys, and have a wonderful Sabbath. Good morning, church. Please stand for our scripture reading. Uh, on the bulletin, it says two scriptures, but I'm going to read the first one, which, is, which was our main scripture for the week. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7. If we could all read it from the screen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Amen. I will be reading Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. But now apart from the law, a righteousness of God hath been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ unto all them that believe, for there is no distraction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Thank you. You may not be seated. church happy sabbath i'm going to take this time to take any prayer requests and praise reports there should be a microphone going around a praise report for having spent a wonderful week with our windermere family but for the young people that took their stand last night Amen. For me, please pray for me that that time when I cross my word to my mom again, okay? And, I, and please pray for me when I cross my word to my mom again, okay? Amen. Amen. So that's so please pray for that, okay? Amen. Amen. I'd like to just um, report to the church on last 
settled afternoon, uh, wife and I went to visit the Guyans. And um, Brother Guyan wanted to send his regards and to thank the church for continuing to pray for him and his wife. Uh, they are doing a very good and a lot better. So just let's, let's continue to keep them in prayer. I have to stand or I can sit down? You can sit. Okay. Hi, my name is Divine. I'm from North Carolina and I came down here for my internship. Um, her mom actually helped me in discovering this church. I'm a woman of faith at home, but you know, I was trying to find a church. But my birthday's tomorrow. Oh. So I really just want to pray for my 20s. As I enter my 20s, I want to continue to strengthen my faith with Christ and just pray for protection and peace and joy. Okay. For those who can kneel, please do so. Day. Thank you for providing us with the opportunity to wake up this morning and to bless you and all that you have continued to provide us with. Please continue to bless us, bless the sermon, allow it to nourish us and rejuvenate our appreciation for what you have done for us, for allowing us to make it through each and every day with the strength that you have given us. Thank you for allowing us to have a blessed and a magnificent youth week. Thank you for all of the youth that came out and engaged in the conversations that we were given. Please continue to bless us, bless us on our traveling mercies to and from our given destinations. And to those who are online, thank you for joining us and being a part of our Windermere family to praise you. Continue to bless us and thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath again, church. So it's youth day, so a lot of you guys aren't youth, but I want you to have a little, you know, youthness in your body, because it's praise and worship time. We're going to give God all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We're just going to praise the Lord. And funny enough, that is the first song, Let's Just Praise the Lord. Because out of all the things you do during the week, at the end of the day, we all want to give him praise and honor and glory, because he is the one and only true God.
next song that we're going to sing is My Life is in Your Hands. You guys know this song? It says, you don't have to worry and don't you be afraid. Because what? Troubles what? Because why? Who will do what? And if your heart is lonely, just lift your hands and say. So as we sing this song, I invite you guys to sing this song with us.
Jesus, with Jesus I can take it. With Him I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in Your Amen, 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 somebody. Man, I was sitting there with tears running down my eyes, you know, just to think. No matter what, no matter what comes my way, my life is in the hand of God. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to do. He's, my life is in his hands. It's now time for us to worship by giving. And as the deacons come forward, allow me to share something with you real quick. Well, let me ask you first, what is a budget? What is a budget? It's a financial plan. I like that. Anybody else? What is a budget? All right, let me, let me break it down. A budget is you telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Do you have a Twitter account? Come on, put, put it on Twitter. A budget is you telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this, folks, because we're living in a world where if we don't have a budget, we're what's, what one of my professors in college called up a creek without a paddle. Because that budget is what helps us to guide or finances what it allows us to do is it allows us to save more give more and spend more a budget helps you to save more give more and spend you decide you decide and so today, let me encourage you, if you don't have a budget, consider making one. All you do is you list your, your income and your expenses, and every month, a budget is supposed to be unique to that month. And if your expenses is more than your income, then we've got a problem. Because then we can't give. And then we have nothing to save or to spend. So let me encourage you one more time. If you don't have a budget, there's a lot of tools out there. You can use an Excel spreadsheet. You can download a simple app that allows you to budget so that we can tell our money where to go and not having to wonder where it is or where it's going or where it went. The deacons will now proceed.
with our eyes bowed and our heads closed, let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we thank you for an opportunity we have to give. We pray, God, that you bless us so we can continue to give to your cause, knowing that when we give to your cause, we're investing in your kingdom. Continue to bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Good morning, church. We are going to have a baptism today. Oh, Pastor Carter has, has just gone and just let the Lord use him. I made you a promise last week. I told you that when you heard him, he was just getting started. That it was going to get more better and more better each day. Last night, I thought the roof was going to come off this place. Don't know what we can expect this morning as the Lord leads him and uses him. But I'm going to ask all of the baptismal candidates, there should be seven of you, please go to the back and meet us just, meet the deacons and deaconesses just outside the door. Then you'll be coming back in and uh, enjoying the service. After the meditation. The next voice that we will hear will be the one instrument that God has sent in this place for this time, Pastor Patrick Carter.
the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make her boast in the Lord the Bible says is there someone that can magnify the Lord with me today is there someone that can say God is so good all the time amen David said I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears they looked unto him and their face was lighted and their faces were not ashamed this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles how many of y'all can taste and see that the Lord he is good amen so good to be here in the house of the Lord amen you know it's interesting sometimes I forget I can forget myself because I remember how much God has brought me through the things that God has already promised to take me through. And I just begin to give God some praise. Amen. Look here. Let me share. Who, let, me, let me start over here. Who is thankful over here? What are you thankful for? Life. What else are you thankful for? Health. Well, over this side, what are you thankful for? So, if the Bible says enter into his course with thanksgiving and into his gates with praise why in the world are we sitting around like a knot on a log so let me ask you again can you magnify the lord with me come on stand on up to your feet if god has been good to somebody today you ought to say thank you lord for all you've done thank you for carrying me safely lord thank you because what could have been did not happen amen praise god please be seated i spoke with someone from our church this morning and they said uh make sure you represent well and i said i i think i have i pray that i have because sometimes you know folk get away and some well dr dr cross you know sometimes they say pastor go there but don't go there and be too much because you need to come on back home amen but it is so good. Uh, my wife and I, we are here. She's sitting back there with that pink cast on. And uh, so I had to bring her with me because she had surgery last month. And um, I wanted to make sure that she would be taken care of. Amen. Now, uh, we do have a child up there, a daughter, but she has her own child. Uh, <laughs> Lord, I'm talking into the water bottle, gracious peace. But she came on with me, amen. And um, so I'm grateful. This December, as I shared before, will be 33 years of marriage. 33 years of marriage. I cannot believe I survived that long. <laughs> I can't believe she survived that long. Amen. But there is a bit of sadness as we come to this conclusion. Because uh, we're going to be heading back this evening, uh, heading back to the house. And I uh, got to get back and, you know, continue ministry there um, with the congregation, the flock that we've been assigned to, that God has assigned to us. But I must say, and I think I speak for both of us, that we have thoroughly enjoyed our time here with our Windermere family. Oh, we certainly wanted to say thank you again to Dr. Cross, Dr. Crosses, for their kind hospitality um, they allowed us to stay at a, a resort area that was just beautiful uh, relaxing you know i got out and was able to take a walk a few days and just enjoyed it you know um and i was just grateful you know i'm also thankful that no alligators came out <laughs> but it was beautiful and it was relaxing and interestingly enough Doc, it's something that we kind of sort of needed, you know. We, so we thank you. Thank you so very much. 
Dr. Beverly, you look beautiful in that royal blue over there, man. I, I can't, you know, I love royal blue and white, you know, so you look beautiful today. Mommy, you look, Sister Myers, you look beautiful in your royal blue, amen? Praise the Lord. Hey, Daddy, how you doing, man? You know, yeah, they had you working too hard, brethren. You know, you got to let them know, hey, 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 you can't do that. Also, Elder Carl Gale, I saw him this morning. I don't know if you saw it, Tara, but uh, Elder Gale, go back there and show her. Just please, just go back and show it. No, 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 man. Come on. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Because she's going to look. She's wondering now, what am I talking about? Man, go back and show her, please. Please. You see what he's wearing? Yes. Well, what about the suit? She can't see that far, I guess, now. You know, man, go back and let her see. Take a real good look at what he got on. Look at the colors. Huh? Yeah, I got one just like that. I think he took a trip to Atlanta <laughs> and raided my closet, but that's a, that's a sharp suit he has on, amen. But everybody looks wonderful today. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and get into the word of God. Uh, the time is now 1229. Would you all give me about 25 minutes, please? I just need your attention for 25 minutes. Hey, baby girl, how you doing? Oh, come on, baby girl. You want to preach with me? Yeah. All right. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just come to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for those who are being baptized today. And I pray, God, that someone will hear the spirit knocking at the heart door. And, Lord, they will respond and be baptized today. Lord, I appreciate Dr. Cross who firmly believes that when people come to you, that there's no need to hold them up. Let them connect with you, Lord. And God will do our part to help disciple along with you those who come into your kingdom by way of baptism by immersion. And, Father, we're going to talk today about the pit, the prison, and the palace. Talk about your anointing, God. So, Father, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Now, for those who missed out on this week, um, I think we had a wonderful week. Um, there are many who were financially blessed uh, this week. Amen. If you were financially blessed this week, young folk, whomever, if you were financially blessed, just wave your hand. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of folk who got financially blessed, and we were not trying to do that to bring people out. We we're just simply saying we're using this to help plant seeds. Amen. And uh, I did make mention last night, return tithe and offering. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. The Bible says, and Jacob dwelt in the land, Genesis 37, wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. How old? Was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And let this be a... a, a, a a lesson. I know some people talk about polygamy is all right, but no, it's not. Find that one husband, find that one wife that God brings to you and gives you, and then spend the rest of your days with them unless the Lord uh, says, okay, I need to move you in a different direction. Amen. As someone may have lost a spouse before and God blesses them to come together with someone else again. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. In other words, Joseph was a snitch. Anybody ever had a, a family member, a brother or a sister, no matter what you did, they're always telling on you? And you <laughs> I mean, y'all must have been bad. <laughs> now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw it, they, they, that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. 
Verse 5, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to, thee on, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And then what the Bible says. Joseph went up to bury his father, Genesis 50. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of the house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren in his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks, their herds that they left in the land of Goshen. And then the Bible says, and when Joseph's brethren saw that father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly require us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And when Joseph wept, when they, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For, I am in the, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. I wanted to read that to give you an idea of what it was like to be Joseph who was given a dream. Many of us in here have a lot of dreams. Amen? Has anyone in here not had a dream? You know, I used to dream that I'd be up on stage with Michael Jackson. Some of y'all had a dream you might be up on stage with Beyonce or Jay-Z or, you know, whoever else. You know, we've got so many littles out there. I don't know who, Lil Baby, Lil Uzi Vert, you know, Lil Wayne, Lil This, Lil That, you know. How many littles are out there? You know, I don't know. I mean, so many of them. I'm like, everybody little? What, what's, what's, what, what's, what, what's with that? But the Bible says that Joseph was someone that God put a vision in. And I want to share with someone here today that God has placed a vision in each of you. And many of us, hear me on this, know that God has placed a vision in us. But we are afraid to allow that vision to have its way in our life. Many of us will find ourselves Living a particular life because it is comfortable, it is safe, and it will not cause you and I to step out of our norm because we are afraid of the dream. I recall there were times when I was sitting around and, and, and I knew the Lord had placed a call on my life and, and I went and talked to my pastor at the time and I said, Pastor, I believe God has placed a call on my life to go into ministry and my pastor at that time said, you don't want to do that because it has caused me great anguish. And, I want, and I, that's what I heard and that's what I wanted to hear and, and so for a few more years, I went running away from the call. Let me share something with you. Just like Jonah thought that he could get away from God by going into, the, uh, in, uh, into a whole different direction. Let me share something with you. When God has a plan for your life and God has a plan for your life, no matter what you do, God is going to U-turn you back into what he already designed for you to do. There's no one in the world that can do what God has put in you to do. I'm reminded how there in the wilderness and when the children of Israel were there building the tabernacle and they were trying to figure out who's going to do this and who's going to do that. And God told Moses, Moses, I have already put in this person and that person the ability to do this. 
Some folk are amazed. They're like, Pastor, how do you remember people's names? Part of it, I don't know. The other part is, I try to make mental hooks so that it helps me to remember people's names. But as I was sharing with the pastor, and we both agree, it's interesting, the pastor has to know one million people, and one million people only have to know one pastor. So sometimes it's a difficulty. You don't see someone for a few years, and then they come back and say, you remember me? Oh, boy. So I try to make it my business, but that is perhaps a gift of mine. Many of you all have a gift, amen? But the sad thing is, some of you have lived in regret for years because you're like, I knew I should have been doing something else. But I, I, I watch this. I settled for this. Are y'all with me on that? Steve Harvey tells a story about how there was a man who had a dream and the man went to heaven and he saw all of these gifts that were unopened. And the man said, well, what are those right there? He said, those are the things that you failed to open. You see, God has gifted you and I with something that will shake up the world. But too often is the case, we're like, I'm going to follow somebody else. Oh, I'm going to do it that way because that is going to bring me the applause and praise of people. But when you try to do the things that please people, inevitably, the one that winds up not having any satisfaction is you. So the Bible says there, Joseph, he begins to dream a dream. And, and there, the Bible says, let me come down here, you know. I feel I'm way up here. Excuse me. Man, y'all brethren play real good today, man. Y'all might have come up to West End one Sabbath and help us out. So the Bible says that Joseph begins to dream and then he starts telling his brothers, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They out there bringing in the sheaves, right? And anybody ever worked in the garden or, you know, in the field, you know, doing stuff like that, you know, whether it was sugar cane or, or crops or whatever the case might be. We had a garden when I was coming up, when I was younger. And I'm from North Carolina too. Where are you, you know? You. What? I'm from Winston-Salem. Get out of here. And you're down here on an internship? How long are you going to be? What? What is the internship, if I may ask? Oh. Oh. And you just turned, tw you'll be turning 20 tomorrow? What? Boy, hey, 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 hey. Some of y'all young fellas, y'all hear that? <laughs> she going to be here six months. She's from the Piedmont Triad area. Amen. You know, where'd you go? Dudley High School or what? Oh, you in the Southeast. Okay. Now, I only knew about Dudley and Paige. That tells you how old I am. You know what I'm saying? So, are they still there? All right. It's about 30 minutes between where we came. Yeah, she found, oh, yeah. And by the way, you did find the church. No, no, no. I mean, you found the church. Let this side say amen. amen. This side over here. Amen. And what's your name? Divine. Divine. <laughs> Boy, what you say, E, you know what I'm saying? That's divine intervention right there. You know, that might be what gets you up, my God. I'm just saying. Joseph tells them, I had a dream and, you know, the precursor to Martin Luther King Jr. I had a dream and in my dream, we were out there in the field and my sheep stood upright and y'all sheaves bowed down and they got angry with him. And, and by and by he said that I was standing there and I'm like the sun and the moon and everybody else bowed down to me. And his father got a little angry with him and rebuked him and said, who do you think your mother and I are going to come and bow down to you? But let me share something with you. When, and I believe this in my heart of hearts. God gives you snippets of your future. 
And you call it, we may call it, oh, deja vu. It seems like I've been here before. But I believe in my heart of hearts that God gives us snippets of our future to encourage us to say, you know what? Continue on this path and things are going to work out for you. It is when we get off track that sometimes things go awry. But let me share this. Even though you may get off track, God will still use the experiences that you've gained and still help that augment your vision and the dream that he's put in you. The Bible says that then the brothers got mad and they said, you know what, one day uh, we're going to do something to that fellow. And the interesting thing, one day his father said, son, I want you to go and check on your brothers. They're supposed to be down there shearing their sheep down there somewhere. And he goes to where they thought, he thought they were. And the Bible says that a man saw him wandering in the field. He's like, son, what you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brethren. Where are they at? They're down in Shechem. And then the Bible says, Joseph went there looking for them just to see how they were doing. And the Bible says that when they saw Joseph a little ways off, in that reminiscent of the prodigal son's father when he saw him a ways off they said here comes the dreamer and they began to plot his demise we are going to kill this person and the bible says that reuben the eldest said no let's not do that because reuben understood that hear me on this Reuben understood that had they done something to Joseph, it would have ruined their father's life. But I was reading and it said that Reuben, even though he was Jacob's firstborn son, he kind of sort of did not have the right mindset or the attitude. And it's interesting because the birthright, which should have been Reuben's, and the birthright, which should have been Esau's, all of a sudden, because of their actions, it got transferred to another brother. Because it's through Joseph that God saved the people in Egypt. And it is through Joseph's divine intervention through God in heaven that allowed them to be able to survive and Jesus was born. And so they come up with a plan that said we'll put him in a pit. And they threw him down there and they stripped him of his coat of many colors, which was a long robe, had long sleeves, and it came down uh, on top of his feet. And it was reminiscent or, or indicative that this was somebody who had authority and power. And they got so angry because daddy never did that to me. And let me share this with you as a plug. Stop telling your children one is better than the other. Amen. Stop holding one up over the other. I used to tell folk when my children were younger, if you can't do for all, you can't do for none. And I had somebody try to go behind my back. And when they did, I got there with them and I took it back to them. I said, I thought I told you what did not to do. So if you, cannot understand, if you cannot listen to what I say about my children, don't come around my kids anymore. Are y'all with me on that? See, I'm one of them crazy daddies. I would not let people kiss my babies when they were babies. Why can't I kiss them? I don't know where your mouth been. Amen. I don't know if you floss or brush your teeth. This morning. You ain't kiss my baby. I don't know what's on your lips. But we have to because the Bible says that Joseph was Jacob's son of his old age. And sometimes if we are at an advanced age and we have a child that's young, sometimes we will give a little bit more preferential treatment to that child and then your other children be complaining. You ain't never do that to me, daddy. Mama, how come I never got that? It's like our daughter. She talks about her the own daughter. Now see, my wife has spoiled our granddaughter. I'm going to tell it. Yes, I am. I'm tell. I'm tell all on her. She right there. She spoiled that girl. When that little girl gets sick, she wants her grandmother. When grandmother goes and picks her up, they find themselves at Target. And I'm trying to say the GPS says you're only 10 minutes from the house. How did you wind up up there? That's my baby. That's my baby. Right? But the idea is that our daughter complains to us that her daughter gets better treatment from us than she did. 
And I sit back and I scratch my head and I'm like, well, wait a minute. You were the first one that got a cell phone. And we bought you two cars. Ain't nobody else in the family got that but you. Well, Daddy, I'm not thinking about that right now. Whoa, 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 you know. <laughs> so she be tripping, dog. She be like, girl, bye. Kick rocks, you know what I'm saying? Keep it moving, you know. So the Bible says that they got mad with him. They threw him into the pit and they, they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. And even, and, and watch this, that was cheaper than a, a, a slave would bring. They sold him for 20 pieces. A slave would at least brought 30 pieces. But they sold him for less because they valued him less. And you've got to be careful. Number one, hear me on this. A lot of times people will devalue you because they don't recognize the God in you. And because they devalue you, then they sit back and think that there's nothing of importance about you. And then a lot of them would try and cancel you. But when you stand up and stand in your God-given anointing, no matter what anybody else says, you've got to have a firm made up mind that no matter what anybody else says, my God has put something in me and my God is going to see that thing through. I understand you will get discouraged. I understand things will hit you hard, but you've got to learn to dig deep and say, though he slay me yet, I'm going to trust him. Sometimes some folk look at you and think there's nothing. I remember, I, you know, when I was playing basketball, and I was pretty good in my day. Don't none of y'all young folk even think about it because I still got muscle memory, all right? I can still, bow, you know, amen. Oh, some of y'all still shaking your head. You better be glad it's the Sabbath because <laughs> I sure enough take you out there. My God, look at you. You got that look on your face. Man, I will make you cry out there. <laughs> cry, cry, cry. Here, man, I, I have to. <laughs> Who said lace them up? You a rookie. <laughs> you a rookie. I can see that right now. But the fact is, one time I was out playing some ball, and, and they were, they were, you know, we were playing pickup ball, and this one guy was picking everybody. So I'm sitting over there. Rock, I'm sitting over there. You know, I'm just chilling. Right? So he looking around, he keeps looking around, he keeps looking around, keeps looking around. Finally said, Come on, man. I'm like, I said, That's okay. So we got the plan. Game was going back and forth. And then we get on, on a fast break. Right? I rebound the ball, I kick it to him, and I'm running down on the wing. He goes up in the air to make a pass, and he couldn't find nobody. If he comes down, he's going to turn the ball over. And I just said, Whew. he threw it to me. bam a -lam! At the end of the game, he comes to, oh, yeah, dog. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Man, bruh, bruh, man. Can we hurry up with the Sabbath? Dude, what, what? Dr. Cross, I'm going to have to come back down on a Sunday just to handle that. You know, I fly in, handle that, fly back the same night. Amen. Then at the end of the game, I'm looking at him. He looked, well, I didn't know, I didn't know. I said, I know you didn't know. But that's why you do not ever discount anybody because you don't know. And don't you let anybody discount you. I've had so many folk sit back and say, you won't amount to anything. And now they look at me, are we so proud of you? No, 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 no. Remember you had all that to say about me a long time ago. Now you want to talk about, are we so proud of you? No, uh, 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 uh. But, but in my humbleness, I say thank you. <laughs> but deep down, I want to say, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they throw him into the pit and then the Ishmaelites take him on down into Egypt and, and Ellen White writes it this way she says then that when Joseph saw his homeland going into the distant it was at that time at 17 years of age that he then decided I'm going to trust the God that my daddy told me about 
And I'm telling you, young folk, trust God in your younger years. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let me tell you what the evil days are. Your hair gets a little gray. Your knees gets a little, ugh. You, you know, you, get, you wake up in the morning and you're trying to figure out where did that pain come from? You, you know, your eyesight is not as good as it used to be. Your game is not as good as it used to be. You already there, there, though, I think, you know. Oh, he t- the pastor talking trash. <laughs> That's what it is. What can he do, man? Can he play? You can get him, though, right? Oh, yeah, I saw it. My guy, yes, sir, yes, sir. What about you? Oh, you don't play with him? Why, he ain't good enough to play on your squad, right? <laughs> My dude, yes, sir. You the best one there? They said you ain't. The, Bi- the Bible says, let it be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. We just found two witnesses said you ain't, you know. Are they going to find out next week? Today. <laughs> so the Bible says then that Joseph is then taken to Egypt. And there he goes into the marketplace and, and there uh, they come by and they be, they're looking at uh, who can we buy. The Ishmaelites brought him in and then, you know, by God's providence, let me share something with you all. Even though it seems like you are going on a path that doesn't seem like it's going to get you to your dream, understand that God is establishing every part of your route so that when you get to where you need to be, you will be qualified to do and execute what God wants you to do. Sometimes we sit back and say, you know, how is it some people can seem to become successful so quick and it takes others that takes time? It seems like sometimes some folk, they can just go and make money like boom, 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 and it takes you five years to get a third of what they got. God has gifted some people with some things, but he's never left you out of that gifting because as Elder Riches tells us this morning, there is a thing called a budget. Amen? Put your money aside. Let your money start working for you. All right? I'm planning on retiring about another 10 years. Maybe less, but at least 10 years. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to chill. I ain't going to sleep now. Sleeping is not in my DNA. The only, thing, only reason I sleep is because my body tells me to sleep. But I, gotta, I get up in the morning. What time I usually get up, babe? Six o'clock, five or six o'clock in the morning. I don't even have an alarm. Because I have business to take care of. You cannot lay in the bed and expect to be successful. You cannot sit back and talk about when the man gets off my back. When I, when, you know, when I win the lotto, that was a big lotto, wasn't it? <laughs> Did somebody win? Did somebody, you won? Did anybody win that lotto? The Powerball? Did anybody win it? Some of y'all know it. Some, I know some of y'all bought some tickets. I know. <laughs> I know some of y'all bought, I bought a ticket. Because <laughs> I'm going to pay tithe on it. <laughs> there in the marketplace, Potiphar comes. And it's not by some weird break in the time continuum pattern that this Egyptian army captain shows up. All along, God had directed this band of Islamites to come by that pit at one o'clock in the afternoon. And then it was those same Islamites that took Joseph to a certain part of the marketplace where the army people usually go first and pick people that they want to be part of their workforce. And Bible says that Potiphar chose Joseph and then he brought Joseph into his house. And the Bible says that Joseph became so good at what he did that Potiphar made him steward or in charge of everything in the house so much so that Potiphar didn't even know what was going on in his own house and he had to go to Joseph and say what's happening 
But Ellen White writes that Potiphar had all of these different generals and politicians and people who had knowledge about government to be at his dinner table. And while Joseph was serving them as a head steward, he got the opportunity to stand there and hear and be taught everything that he needed when he became prime minister. So never ever look at your place where you are as your permanent place. Look only as a rest stop on your way to glory and to where God has deemed you to be. And then he goes into the prison and there because Potiphar's wife saw how good looking he was and said, come and sleep with me. And he said, no, I can't do that. The Bible says that she called him into the room. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what she did. She went and took a bath. Then she put on all that little smell good stuff. Got her hair done. Got her baby hair laid. <laughs> then she's going to talk. Then she, then she got her eyelashes done. The day before, she went and got her nails. She went and got the mani petty. Then she got her eyebrows bladed. When, then she went and got her face beat. Then she's going to come talking about, Oh, Joseph, <laughs> could you come here and bring me a glass of water? When, since when you asked me for water? So Joseph goes in and she peels the covers back. And there she is, just like Eve in the garden. And she says to him, come and lay with me. And he said, no. Joseph, even though he was in a strange place, never forgot his home values. What does that tell you and I? No matter where you go, you hold on to what you were raised with. Just because everybody else is on the basketball court cussing doesn't mean you have to cuss. And just because everybody else is doing that doesn't mean you have to do that. And Joseph, the Bible says, ran out, but she grabbed him by his jacket. And when Potiphar came home, she said that Hebrew tried to rape me. You see, that ain't nothing new. People saying people rape them, and I'm not in any way saying that a person's experience is not their experience. Because I know sadly that men and women are raped. They are. And sadly, it's happening in the church. Potiphar got so angry. How could you? I put all of this under your charge. You are a slave. You got to understand, some people will never let you forget who you are. No matter how good you've been, no matter how great you've done things, some people will always see you simply as. Then Potiphar had him put in jail. And for two years, Joseph languishes in prison. The whole time he's like, God has a plan, God has a plan, God has a plan, God has a plan. Where is God? I could deal being in the pit and I could deal being a servant in the house, but I cannot deal with this prison thing. But instead of Joseph staying in a depressed state, he got about the business of making sure that he was able to be who he was called to be. Even in prison, the Bible says that the warden saw how good Joseph was and put him in charge. All the time. Now understand, in the pit, he wasn't in charge. When he was at Potiphar's house, he learned what he needed to learn and then he put him in charge. And now he is in charge in prison. He's a top dog in prison. He's the one that says, if you need something, I'm your man. You need cigarettes? Well, if you need, um, you need books, I got that. You need me to get a letter, I got that. 
If you need me to get this, any other, I got that. Joseph was the man in prison. But one day these two guys came and one was a cupbearer, the other one was a cook. And they said, look here, man, I had this dream. And, and here is where Joseph's story begins to turn. Up until that time, Joseph was not an interpreter of dreams. Joseph was only a dreamer. But let me share something with you. When God puts a dream into your life, God also will give you the ability, if needed, to interpret the dreams of somebody else. And how many of you have told somebody, God has shown me, oh, I feel in my spirit that this is going to work out in this way for you. It's because God said, I'm going to tell you this to tell them that so that they can do what they need to do and get back on track. The Bible says then that Joseph said, you know, you're going to be restored and to the other and you're going to die. But he told one, he said, when you get to Pharaoh, don't forget me. But the brother got there and, and he forgot. How many of us sometimes feel forgotten? We've done everything we feel that we can do. We've done all the good stuff. We come to Sabbath school. We come to AY. You know, we come to church. We've been baptized. We go to work faithfully. We do all the things around the house. And But it seems as nobody seems to remember you. And sadly, so many of us are in our homes feeling lonely because nobody remembers us. But God does not call us to be faithful under the bright lights. God calls us to be faithful when there are no lights. For you see, Joseph was in a dark place. But yet, instead of him succumbing to what his surroundings were, he said, I'm going to rise above. Because no matter how his circumstances were, he never forgot his dream. And I'm telling someone here today, no matter how bad things are, don't you ever forget the dream that God has put in your spirit. I remember when I was younger, I was in eighth grade and there we were and we had to take, you know, I was at the church school there, you know, Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, school. And, um, you know, we, we uh, eighth grade, you know, I'm a senior now, you know, and I'm like, how am I a senior? I'm going to the ninth grade. But anyways. I remember that we had a picture and said, what do you want? What is your life's ambition? I had two life ambitions. One was I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Amen. That was my goal. You know, I wanted to work on the brain. That's what I wanted. But you know what my other one said? Or oh, be a pastor. But the joy is, I work on the brain from the spiritual side of the house. And it's interesting because I'm living the dream that God put in me. I tried to do a different career path. It never felt good. Has anybody ever felt that way? You're in something, but you're like, man, this just, eh, this just ain't right. I don't feel good with this. But man, when you get where God wants you to be, man, let me tell you something. I've been 20 years in this joint, boy, and I'm, and I'm loving it, you know. I, are there challenges? Absolutely. But you know what? I remember this is what God put in me. And when you remember what God put in you, it begins to supersede the situations that you're in. Because as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel, I am doing what God has called me to do. And guess what? I love it. I'm not all about up here standing up to preach in front of folk because to me, preaching is only a small part of what a pastor should be. For me, it's about relationships. For me, it's about building consensus. See, when I get up to preach, it's only, hey, this is just part of my job, but that's not who I am. As I said earlier in the week, we have to be very careful that our abilities do not become our identities. And Jacob, excuse me, Joseph had to remember that because he had the ability, he had to understand his identity was in the father. So in the end, the Bible says then that Pharaoh had a dream, weird dream. Saw seven fat cows 
Like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Then had another dream. He saw seven skinny cows. Like, what? He said he couldn't figure it out. So he called his wise people, right? And it's interesting because out of, this, out of these wise people who are supposed to know the future and all that, is a, out of that lineage came the same people that Moses had to deal with later on down the road. He said, I know a dude. Yeah, he's inmate number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, what's his name? I don't know, but man, he told us a dream, and he interpreted my dream, and he told me that I was going to be restored. You were going to be, you're going to restore me unto my position. Well, go get him. And the Bible says, watch this, Joseph had become so sad that he allowed the facial hair to grow out. He allowed his hair to grow out. He was like, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to do what I got to do. Evidently, this is where I'm supposed to be. And so, therefore, I'm just going to make the most of what I got. But then they came and said, Joseph, uh, we got a message for you. What is that? Pharaoh wants to see you. Pharaoh wants to see me? Yeah. He needs to because we heard that you can interpret dreams. And he needs to see you. So the Bible says Joseph went and got a fade, cut it up, you know, Put on the best prison outfit he could put on. Put a little lotion on his knees and on his toes so he wouldn't be too ashy. And he went and he waited for Pharaoh to call him in. And Pharaoh pointed at him and said, I heard that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph is standing there and said, well, I mean, I guess. So Pharaoh told him the dream. And he told Pharaoh the meaning of the dream. He said, Pharaoh, the dream means that there's going to be seven good years of plenty. Crops are going to grow. It's going to be a bountiful harvest. It's going to be such a time as never been seen by Egypt before. But then after that, Seven years are going to be a severe famine. You're going to lose everything. Well, what should I do? Well, now you got to go back. While he was in the pit, he was trying to figure out what's going on. But when he got to Potiphar's house, he learned from all those different dignitaries how to run government. When he got to the prison, he took what he learned and governed the prison. And then when Pharaoh said, well, find me somebody that can do it, what it is. And Joseph was like, well, Pharaoh, I could tell you what you need to do. You take a third, a third, a third, and you do this, you do this, you do this. You set it up here, here, and here, and here. You set your soldiers over this. You set your soldiers over that. You, if you do, 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 do. So Pharaoh was like, well, who else do we have but him? He's told the dream. He's got the plan. And on the spot, Pharaoh promoted him to be the prime minister of, e of Egypt. Amen. Joseph did so well that Pharaoh told him, he said, you have more power outside of everybody except me. How in the world can I go from nearly being killed to now being second in command of the most powerful nation on the earth so what does that mean for us in 2023 you may have been in a pit you may have gone through some stuff but God will put you in a palace wherever that might be and when you get there they're going to rely on you divine they're going to rely on you with your financial analyst stuff to help Disney get over DeSantis But never ever, watch this, never ever look at your current position as your permanent placement. Because if God has a dream in you, it's not finished until God gets you exactly where you need to be. And I'm here today to let somebody know that no matter what you go through, it could be the pit, it could be the prison, but one day you're going to be in the palace. You've been anointed 
And as the dear mother says, you are anointed and appointed as Mordecai told Esther to do what God has called you to do and be. Go ahead and give me some going home music. But let me share something with you. Just like Joseph, there's going to come times where your anointing is going to be tested. Your divine placement is going to be tested. May 30th, 2017. At one church we were serving the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lithonia, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. Our oldest daughter, Tiffany, who was a registered nurse, Tiffany was, she was doing well. Tiffany had bought a house by the time she was 25. She bought herself a BMW X5. And I'm like, I couldn't even say X5. She was doing well doing well we were super proud of her her mom and me so May 30th with that Labor Day that Memorial Day weekend she comes down and says hey I'm coming down to be with y'all doing your family life weekend but during that weekend she got sick and we were in a small town and she was having extreme trouble breathing we wanted to get her back to Atlanta because we're like, maybe they might have some better facilities and stuff there. But she was in such pain, she could not make it. And so we took her to the local hospital and they admitted her. And so we go back to where we were standing and then we come back and she's sitting up, she's talking. And so we leave her and we say, okay, well, everything seems to be okay. Uh, her husband went up to see her and um, but then on May 30th my wife had taken a nursing assignment out in San Diego she calls me my wife and she says you know something is going on with Tiffany and then you know Tiffany calls and she said daddy she said um, you know I'm having real trouble breathing and they want to transport me to another hospital uh, they want to take me via helicopter but it, you know, it's cloudy and the helicopter can't do it. And, and I want them to put me on a BiPAP machine, but they want to intubate me. And she said, Daddy, I don't want to be intubated. And I said, baby, you know, if that's what's going to save you, if that's what's going to keep you alive, let them do that. And she said, okay. And but by and by, our daughter had cardiac arrest. She suffered then an anoxic brain injury. And for the lay people among us like me, lack of oxygen to the brain they tried to tell us that it was only for about two minutes and 45 seconds but we come to find out it was closer to 10 minutes our daughter had irreversible brain damage 27 years old talking about being in a pit that was a pit We are praying, people are praying, folk around the world that we knew were praying. But none of those prayers were answered. Talking now about being in a prison. How in the world can I stand up before people and preach this gospel of the everlasting kingdom and we have a daughter at the house that we are praying for and God is silent. Fast forward to January 25th, 2023, she dies. 33 years old, we had her at home and we were taking care of her. Had to make a decision to remove her from a feeding tube. And there for nearly two weeks, we were watching our daughter waste away. Yet we're getting up every day, we're praying and we're giving God thanks, but sometimes it is hard to give God praise when your heart is hollow. But I'm here today to declare that when God has an anointing in your life, his anointing says, I'm going to be with you through thick and thin. 
We made a decision and our daughter died. 33 years old. 24 hours a day, our daughter needed somebody to keep an eye on her. We're praying, God, will you heal? God, will you restore? God, will you resurrect? And God did not answer the question at all. Sometimes your faith will be tested in this journey. Our faith has been tested. And let me share something with you. We are going to go to our graves with a hole in our hearts. And I know there's others among us who've lost a child. And you kind of got to wonder, God, uh, what's up? Uh, God, you raised that widow's son up, the widow Nain. God, that man by the pool of Bethesda that was there for 38 years, you raised him up. God, that man by the name of Bartimaeus, you healed his eyesight. God, the daughter of Jairus, you raised up from the dead. God, you raised up Peter's mother-in-law from her sickbed. God, where's my answer? God, where's my miracle? God, where is my palace? God says, your palace is not on the earth. Put your daughter to sleep so we can save her. Hardest thing to do in our lives. But I'm on my way to heaven. And I said to God, If this was what it has to be, I'd rather live permanently in the earth made new than temporarily here. For Revelation 21 verse 5, God says, I will make all things new. And I'm here today to let a young person know, don't you think for a moment that something couldn't happen to you. Our daughter was 27 years old she had all of her life ahead of her and by some crazy whatever, she literally died while still alive. Don't you think for a moment that nothing can happen to you. That's why the Bible says today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Give God your life now for in the end it will be the best decision that you've ever made. Some of y'all sitting up here looking like how can he share that story? How can I not share the story? We were talking about our daughter last night and some of the things that we miss. We miss her laugh. We miss her some of the crazy things that she's saying. But you know, one day, we're going to be reunited. There's a song that says, reunited, and it feels so good. Reunited, because we understood there's one perfect thing, and this is what it means. Reunited. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. And the dead in Christ. And we who are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up to meet them in the air. God is going to allow our family to reunite together around his glory. And we're going to pass on through the skies. Tomorrow I ain't promised to you. So don't front and don't flex like it is don't think that you can survive in these streets there's a lot of men and women in here younger folk that have survived the street and they could tell you some stories but more than likely their story is always going to include the one that didn't make it and I'm sharing this to young men today. Don't ego trip. Somebody come up on you and they want to flex and all this that and the other. If you can, get away. More times than not, people die because of ego. You ain't going to talk to me that way. Man, like last night, on, on the way home, 
Somebody behind me, I was just telling my wife yesterday, I said, man, we've been in Orlando all week long, and I've not heard nobody blow a horn. Now, in Atlanta, they always blow, ah, 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 move, ah, 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 man, shut But somebody got behind me last night. Bah, bah, running up on me, bah, bah, running up on me. I'm reaching under my pill, under the seat. I'm like, ooh, I'm not home. Run up, run up. <laughs> but we had such a wonderful praise experience last night that the Lord said, son, just pull to the side. So I just pulled to the side and, and the person behind, they blew again, like pa pa pa, And then another car was right behind them. And so then I turned, I waited. Then I came out behind them. And the enemy was like, run them down. I was like, yeah. But then the Lord said, but I just saved some people. So I began to just give God praise. That one, he saved folk. But secondly, my ego didn't trip. So what I'm sharing with somebody here today, you might be in your pit. You might be in a prison. But God is expecting you to go to the palace because he put that in you and so today if you want to get baptized you want to renew yourself by saying you know what pastor I've already been baptized but I've heard the Lord speaking to me the Holy Spirit is talking to me and I feel the need that I might need to rededicate myself through baptism we'll go ahead and get you changed right now is there anyone who would like to do that don't look at nobody else because nobody else hear me your salvation is singular not plural you're not going to get to heaven on mother or father or grandmother or granddaddy's faith. You've got to get there on your own. So is there anybody? Anybody, just raise your hand. Anybody want to rededicate? Anybody want to rededicate? Anybody needs to be baptized. You've not been baptized before, but you're saying, Lord, I need to make a change. I need to get out of this pit. I need to go. I need to get out of this prison. I need to go. Is there somebody? Is there anybody? What, young lady, young man, man or woman? Is there anybody? Amen for Christian. Come on, Christian. Praise the Lord. Come on up here, man. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. Come on up here, man. Now, do you want to get baptized today or you want to? All right. Pastor, he wants to get baptized today. Go on back there, man. They're going to take you. Sister Danae is going to take care of that for you. Is there anybody else? Some of us, oh, well, you know, I'm not ready. I'm not, I'll get, I, I, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. You know what? Tomorrow ain't promised to you. Tomorrow is not promised to you. I shared earlier in the week that I had a gun to my head. The man could not pull the trigger because the Lord had his hand on it. And then an angel led me out of that lion's den. And I'm here today. You know, if I were to tell you I've been locked up, would you believe me? Yeah, I've been there too. So what I'm trying to tell folk, ain't nobody here harder than me. Because I was at ninja once upon a time I could come and take your life and wouldn't think twice about it but God did a number on me now I know some of y'all think oh he can't no no trust me trust and believe I had offered a guy five thousand dollars pay me that and I'll take care of that problem for you really But that was my pit experience. That was my locked up experience. But I'm living in my palace right now. My palace here and my palace to come. And I'm here today. My wife will tell you I was crazy. Real crazy. Sometimes she says I'm still crazy. But what I'm saying is. Look at what God has done for, to me and for me. 
change my life. I don't do those things anymore. I try not to do some of those things. But I'm here today to let you know that God placed a vision and a dream in me. And I'm living out my dream. And God wants you to live out your dream. So give God your life. Stop playing games with God. Stop living in limbo. Give God your life. And it's the best thing you've ever done. I promise you that. You look at me. Someone who used to do cocaine and receive the offering. Go to church high as a kite. Serving as a deacon. Talking about happy Sabbath. But God took that away from me. And I, I, I'm not going to say if he could do it for me, he could do it for you. I'm just simply saying, this is what God is an expert in doing. God is an expert. None of you all would have ever thought that by looking at me, would you? How many of you all think that I was, I, I, I'd be in a position I could kill a person and not think about it? Anybody? Why not? It's not that I don't look like it. It's because there's somebody on the inside that has changed me. And what you see on the outside is nothing more than the Holy Spirit doing his work. Continually doing his work. And so, I'm not perfect. But we serve a perfect God. I'm still striving. I'm still pushing. I'm still struggling. But like Paul says, I forgot those things. And I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward come. Lord, place my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and I shall stand. By faith on heavens. What's the rest of it? No higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet. You want God to plant your feet on higher ground? Come on up a little bit higher. Is there anybody else? I'm turning over to Pastor Dr. Cross right now. But if there's anybody else who feels it, just let us know. You can go back and change. Elder Johnson is there. They'll go back and change. Uh, Sister Danae is back there. You know, uh, she'll come and she'll help you get changed. Pastor. Praise the Lord. Isn't this wonderful? You know, I was wondering, I was wondering what we could give Pastor Carter to take back, you know. But when I heard the praise team and the musicians that said, uh-huh, that's enough. The praise team was on point today. Won't you say amen? I'll take off my Michael Kors and give my wife to hold. I don't want to. Praise the Lord. Hey. I know there is somebody else. I just feel that in my spirit. I'm about to do the vows. And, and I want you to come because this is your time. When Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, it was a moment like this. Don't procrastinate. Don't delay. I know you are here. Get ready. It's your time now. What a powerful message we got today. From the pit to prison to the palace. A palace awaits each one of us because we are all princes and princesses. All you've got to do right now is claim your birthright. Claim it. I'm about to do the vow. Is there one more? You can make it. It's never too late. Even while the baptism is going on, if you are overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, it caught up like a fire within you. You can make it. Praise God for these seven candidates right now. I'm going to ask you to stand and come right in front here. 
We're going to do the vows. Stand right across here. All right. You can turn and face the congregation. Let them see you. I'm going to ask you just four or five simple questions. I had to memorize these just to get them on paper. I want to get them right. These are your baptismal vows. And you're making a vow before God and man. Amen? So listen to the questions and you can just answer by raising your hands. Which means this is in the affirmative. So your raised hand will mean yes. All right? Okay, they asked me to take a pause because yet another candidate is on his way or her way. Let's say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, at such a time like this, I want my praise team to be standing by. Amen. I want my praise team to be standing by because they're going to have to just take us on the mountain and, and, and just do that even if you have to do over some of those beautiful songs at this time because we anticipated this. We know that's what God was about to do. We weren't sure how or when. Amen. We even have Emmanuel coming by with extra gowns and robes and what have you because we just knew the spirit was going to do this. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to wait. The praise team is going to just take us somewhere as we wait. This is God's time. And if you're still languishing in the valley of the shadow of decision, the sun is shining. Break free. Break free. Pastor? Yes. Let's sing the song. Take me to the water. All right, we got that. Can everybody say that with us? Amen. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. Amen. None but the righteous. Nothing but the right. None but the righteous to be baptized. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. At this time, Dr. Cross will. Um, he was going to read the vow. We're going to do the vow and yes. the other person will catch on because we know that even during the baptism, some people are going to make up their minds. Okay? And we're talking about all God's children. That include adults. Okay. All right, young people. With a raised hand for yes. Do you accept the Bible as God's inspired word? Amen. Good. Do you believe in the second coming of God and is this second coming your desire to see him when he comes? Amen. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and it is your desire to honor God by caring for your body, by abstaining, by keeping away from on clean foods and beverages. Amen. Do you believe in the Ten Commandments? And it is, is this your desire to keep this Ten Commandment, the law of God, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Do you believe in water baptism? And is it your settled desire and determination this afternoon to be baptized by immersion as a profession of your faith? Amen. Knowing and understanding the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is it your desire now 
to order your young lives according to these principles. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. I'm going to ask a member of this church to move a motion that we accept these candidates now subject to their baptism. It has been moved. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? Thank you very much. It's carried. I'm going to ask the deacons and deaconesses to do your job and pastor will take it from here. We have a deep desire for a candidate who wants to be baptized today, but out of love and honor and respect for parents who are not here, that person says, I am ready, but I will just wait until parents are here. Amen? We appreciate that. Amen. So we're going to ask that uh, you all come up here once the pastor gets into the water. Um, Anthony, you'll be first. Ariana, then Destiny, then Kinsey. Aiden, Kinsai, Alex, and Peyton will be there. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 We're so thankful and grateful. Amen. God is good. Amen. And let me share this as well. Parents, if your child expresses a desire to connect with God through baptism, don't hold them back. Because one day, when you want them, they're going to tell you, I'll get to God when I'm ready. So one of our greatest gifts that we, matter of fact, the greatest gift that you can give your child is to give them back to the one that gave them to you. Amen. And now, Brother Anthony, because you have made the Lord your calling and election, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Yes, I do. Our next candidate for baptism is Miss Ariana. With the parents and friends of Miss Ariana, would you please stand as we honor God through her baptism? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Miss Ariana, because you know that God has a heaven for you to gain, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen, amen, and amen. I was praying all week for all of our young folk. Amen. And all of them are special. But here's a real special one right here. Amen. We have Miss Destiny who is getting baptized, amen. Will all the family and friends of Sister Destiny please stand, amen. We're going to ask Mother Kayla to come a little bit closer, a little bit closer, amen, amen, and amen. Uh, Dr. Cross, uh, make sure you put that, uh, don't, don't put the rag on her baby hair, you know. <laughs> so. Our dear Destiny, Destiny, 
you are a leader and God is going to lead, lead you to lead other people. And because you love God and want to do what he asks you to do, we now baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can see. Can see. And um, we have Kensi uh, is coming up. Kensi's dad, uh, Mr. Leo, Brother Leo, is here today. Amen. And their little brother Kyrie is right there with him as well, right? Brother, we appreciate you letting your sons get baptized. Amen. So Kensi, come on into the pool. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Yes. That's the pastor right there. Amen. Amen. Our future pastor, Ken C. You said to God, Lord, here am I. Use me. We now baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Yes. Pastor Ken C. Amen. Now we have Brother Aiden is coming on here. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Head Deacon. Head Deacon Aiden. That's who that is. Amen. 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 Folks, look here. We tell folk, be a lawyer, be a doctor, do all this and the other. But how many of us say, be a Sabbath school superintendent, be a head deacon, be a head deaconess, you know, be a Sabbath school teacher. You know what? Let's, let's, let's start telling them that they can do these things in the church, a wide leader and so forth. Brother Aiden, because you have said to the Lord, Lord, I want to be saved when you come in your kingdom. We now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen and amen. Now have Brother Kinsai coming on now. Yes, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Head elder. That's first elder right there. Amen. Amen. Hello to grandmama. Amen. <laughs> Brother Kensai, because you said, Jesus, you died on the cross so that I don't have to die eternally. So I love you and I accept you. We now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We now have our, our conference president coming up. Brother Alex. Amen. Brother Alex. The Lord has called you to stand out and stand up. So we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. And now coming, we have Miss Peyton Ford, 
CEO of Advent Health, coming up here. Amen. My dear sister Peyton Ford. And her mom told me the other day that Peyton is not on social media at all. I said, have mercy. We got to make sure we give her a gift, Sister Carter, before we get up out of here. Amen. But Peyton, because you said, Lord, here am I. Like Samuel heard his voice. You are saying, Lord, here am I. Speak because your servant hears. We now baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praise team is going to come on up and they're going to sing this song. If you know this song, sing it with us. Amen. But if there's anybody else that feels a need to be either baptized today or perhaps at another time, Dr. Cross, our first elder, our team will be here to speak with you, pray with you, study with you. And we thank you for being here. Come on up, praise team. Down here, down here. Not up there. Right here. Amen. All right, do you know that song? I might sing the song, huh? My wife telling me no. If you know the song, we want you to sing it with us, amen, because we want to give God praise today, amen. No, 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 total praise. Uh, amen, amen. We love, we love the hymns. Please don't get us wrong. Big Shy Josh, we love the hymns, but we're going to sing this song today. Amen. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet with us. Stand to your feet.
Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. Thank you to our musicians. Let's bow our heads and we're going to say grace as we do this as well. Father, thank you so much for the blessing of those who were baptized, those who responded to the message. But God, we know that there are still others who are saying yes to you, Lord. They may not have taken a stand today, but God, they're still saying yes. And God, we pray now in the name of Jesus today. Lord, do not allow us to fall up out of our anointing. But God, if we do, we have the promise that if we fall, we can get back up again. And Lord, help us to remember that we have been designed and destined for glory. Now let the food that has been wonderfully prepared nourish and bless us. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for who you are. In the name of Jesus, let the saints of God say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you all. Um, go, y'all yeah, going out the door. Y'all know where the uh, place is, right? Fellowship Hall's over there, right? No, you don't, have to, you don't have to usher us out. You can usher them out. I'm going to walk on to the kitchen. Amen. God bless you. Emmanuel. <laughs>